Good evening. I'm Betsy Stites. I'm the president of the Woodbury Cottage Grove Area League of Women Voters, and I am really thrilled to have you all here tonight for our program on local redistricting 101. We've got some wonderful panelists tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to them in a moment. But I just wanted to review again the important vision, values, and our nonpartisan statement, uh, just so that um, it's a good reminder for all of us. Um, we envision a democracy where every person has the desire, the right, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate. We value and believe in the power of everyone to create a more perfect democracy. And I'm gonna read our nonpartisan statement because it really is a hallmark of the League of Women Voters. The League is nonpartisan, neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties at any level of government, but always working on vital issues of concern to members and the public. And Obviously, what we do um, here is try to empower our voters and defend democracy. And again, I want to welcome you, welcome our panelists, and I'm going to turn it over to Andrea Hobley, our vice president, who is going to be our moderator tonight. And Andrea, there you go. Thank you, Betsy. A welcome to our local redistricting 101 program. I'm Andrea Hobley, and I am the Vice President and Program Chair of the League of Women Voters of the Woodbury Cottage Grove area. Uh, I'll be moderating today, and we wanted to let you know that we do have the Q&A open. So if you have a question, please feel free to go ahead and ask it. And our plan is that if you ask a question that's relevant to what we're talking about, we may go ahead and ask during the program. But otherwise, we have allocated time at the end for other questions. So if you ask a question and we, we don't answer it right away, just know that we do have time at the end for that. Uh, so we have two speakers tonight. Um, our first speaker I want to introduce is Kathy Tinglestad. Uh, she's a 30-year member of the League of Women Voters in the Anoka area. She's also a retired state legislator where she was part of state redistricting in 2000. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, where she was part of uh, uh, state redistricting in 2001 and currently volunteers full time um, as the president of a statewide political organization. Prior to retirement, she was the government relations director for Anoka County for six years. Uh, during that time, she was part of local redistricting in 2011. So part of the reason we asked her to speak to us is because she's been involved in redistricting both at the state and local level. Um, this followed 12 years in the Minnesota House of Representatives where she chaired the Government Operations Committee and also served on several legislative committees, including the Redistricting Committee. In addition, Kathy also served as a school board member in Minnesota's largest school district, and she has served on several nonprofit board of directors. Most of Kathy's career was as a public relations consultant since her undergrad college degree was in journalism from the University of Minnesota. She also has an MBA from the University of St. Thomas. In her spare time, Kathy enjoys travel and photography. She and her husband live in Coon Rapids and they have two grown sons. And our other speaker tonight is um, Stan Karwaski. He is a Washington County commissioner serving District 2 since 2016. Um, he is going to be doing a, presenting a PowerPoint first. So you may be seeing his, his slide up now. Um, he was serving his fourth term in the Oakdale City Council when he was elected mayor in 2014. Uh, he's a past president and current member of the uh, District 622 Education Foundation and is past chairman and member of the Washington County Park and Open Space Commission. He's also served with the Yellow Ribbon Network, Oakdale's Planning Park Commission, and has served as a student reading and robotics mentor. In 2020, he served on the County Canvassing Board certifying state legislative and national election vote accuracy. Stan is also a League of Women Voters Woodbury Cottage Grove area member. Um, he's a native of St. Paul, has lived in Oakdale since 1987. He's married and has four adult children and four grandchildren. He is retired 38 year employee of Graco Inc where he was a principal designer and he holds six invention pat patents. All right, Stan, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you, Andrea. 
Uh, it's an honor to uh, be here and hopefully we'll make this uh, interesting, the presentation and you'll have some questions. Um, um, first slide, please. I don't know if you, if you wanna get that on the full screen. For me, it's just a partial screen right now, but I'll leave it that way and I'll start, but okay, I think you're, um, okay. Well, I'll start here. Uh, redistricting is a process of redrawing the boundaries of the election districts to ensure that people uh, of each district are equally represented and that's part of the constitution. So this happens as part of the 2020 census that has ended and now they're uh, interpreting that data. It's actually called the decennial census, which means every 10 years it, and the data lasts for 10 years. Um, the key thing right now is the federal government will handle the census first and they'll decide on how many seats get congressional representation. There's 435 congressional seats you might have heard about this. We have seven and we're always in jeopardy of losing one. We're kind of on the bubble uh, about that. Um, typically they would, uh, uh, we would receive, they would complete this around March or April. Uh, we hear that it may not be till midsummer that they turn over the census data for then uh, we can take it to the next step of setting up districts. So uh, the first step, uh, they'll determine how many congressional seats each state has. And that does change for certain states each every 10 years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the federal was the first step. The state level is the second step. The state legislature, uh, um, constitutionally is responsible for redistricting the congressional seats. The example would be if we drop to six congress congressional seats, they'll have to draw those boundaries. Then they'll set the boundaries for the Senate and the House districts and the Metropolitan Council districts. This must be done by February 15th, but that date is I've heard in very much jeopardy uh, the courts usually get involved if the legislature doesn't keep to their deadline. Um, the House and Senate, they designated uh, committee leads. Uh, Mary Murphy, I hear, is representing the House side and sharing it. Uh, I've heard she's got a great bipartisan support and she's like a perfect fit. And then on the Senate side, which is controlled by the Republicans, uh, Mark Johnson will handle that. So these two individuals were picked because they can kind of bring consensus. So we'll see how that uh, pans out. Uh, the one, by the time the 2021 legislature session adjourns, uh, they, they have to enact a redistricting plan. And if they don't, the courts step in and they may lift uh, the stay on their ability to get that done and then they, the courts would establish a special redistricting panel and appoint its members. And that has happened quite frequently in the last few de decades. Um, the panel would uh, likely begin work and have public hearings this summer and fall. And new, ba uh, new maps have to be drawn and enacted by February 15th. That's, uh, that's the current law. Uh, so those maps have to be ready by February 15th. We'll see. Uh, next slide, please. Then the third step, it moves to the cities and townships. Uh, municipal precincts boundaries are drawn by cities and townships. The deadline this for this would be March 29th of 2022. Who, um, and they'll have 60 days uh, following completion of the previous slide on legislative districts. Uh, considerations that uh, cities will take would be the size, uh, size for uh, election administration, 
location of polling places is really key when they change boundaries for that it's easy access to get to uh, centrally located preferably and then they can't split the congressional uh, boundaries and legislative districts on those precincts so they're basically taking what the state has described as boundaries and then trying to work precincts within those uh, normally follow uh, census blocks but are required to follow visible clearly recognized physical feature type boundaries um, Again, they have six weeks to complete this time, the cities do. Um, some of the things that uh, the cities take into consideration uh, are the, well, I mentioned the location of polling places. Uh, and the cities cannot split a congressional or legislative district. So that's key. Um, in, in, a town like Stillwater, there's wards. So they actually have to determine those ward sizes so that there's equal uh, size. And that's required by law to be within 10%, no more than 10% difference between any wards, any precincts, any boundaries. Um, next slide, please. Now, last in line uh, to get the boundaries really solidified as the county's role. The map shows uh, the entire county, um, but um, Washington County County Board uh, usually is the redistricting authority. It may appoint a redistricting commission that would really only happen, I would hate to say it, if for some reason things got political or got controversial. That's the only way I could see that happening. Uh, I don't think there's a history of that at a county board level. So the considerations uh, is the uh, must be uh, created using precinct lines, uh, contiguous, regular and compact practical, uh, Nearly equal in population, the 10% rule. Uh, Established operating principles. And, uh, and then we also would set, because all five commissioners would be up, we'd have to set two and four year terms to resume uh, for not everybody would be up for election at one time. We'll have to establish who those persons would be up to run for a two year and what districts would be up for a four year. Um, we have even a shorter amount of time. So we're taking uh, equalizing these uh, boundaries for each district. There's five districts. We don't anticipate going to seven uh, county board members and having seven districts. Right now we're the uh, largest uh, county with only five county board members. Um, the process is uh, open to the public. Uh, on our website, we'll solicit input. Um, but really, it's going to follow established standards and principles by, set by law. Um, again, the, the key is uh, we can't split precincts. So we're gonna to have to take existing precincts and decide what precincts balance the population the best. We try to make uh, one of the laws and principles is uh, uh, precincts, putting districts together that have precincts that have a similarity, like precinct five uh, is kind of the river, the St. Croix River type towns. And then we have a precinct three, I believe is all of Woodbury because Woodbury is so heavily populated. Next slide, please. And this is the last slide. Um, again, I'm just gonna recap the important dates. February 15th uh, of 2022 is the new congressional and legislative districts uh, are established. Then uh, March 29th, 
is the reestablishment and redistricting of the municipal precincts by the cities and townships. And then April 26 is the is the county with the new local government election districts, a county school districts, et cetera. And then August 9th, uh, by April 26, you have to establish it because then you have filing for August 9th um, primaries, which usually filing might start in June. So it's really a tight passage of, uh, of uh, people holding to their obligation of federal, state, city and city and uh, municipality, and then the county, those four uh, election or governmental bodies have to keep to their schedule. Um, so there's a lot of activity during a short period of time. Um, watch our website as we get into 2022. Um, hopefully that helped. I'm open for questions. Um, one question that came in um, while you were talking is, you mentioned that it's one of the larger counties to, um, I believe, did you say there's five commissioners right yes. now? Is there a possibility to go up to additional commissioners or is that not something that would be on the table? Yeah, that can be considered and I think it can be uh, adopted right up to setting the boundaries. Uh, I'm not privy to any date requirement on that. The county board kind of anticipates that even like the last year or two. And we feel we can handle the workload. Right now, our population of our county, when we established the boundaries 10 years ago, it was basically about 50. 5,000 people per county commissioner. Um, and that was based on 250,000 people about. Now it's gonna be up around 300,000 people and it'll probably be about 65,000 per commissioner. We feel we can handle that with committee assignments and doing the people's work. Uh, so we're not anticipating uh, any change in that. We don't feel the... Uh, representation would be any better to the public, but uh, we're gonna be open-minded about it till we have to make that decision for sure. Are there any um, requirements about that or is it just um, something that's kind of open to the, at the discretion of the county? Right, it is at the discretion of the county. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, there are counties that are smaller that have seven uh, board members, it's either uh, uh, Scott or Carver, one of those two, I apologize for not knowing, but they're half the population, about 125,000. Um, it, uh, you know, our, we keep ours where it's basically a full-time job. Um, there's no set hours, but to do it properly, I believe it's uh, a full-time job. My wife, Linda, reminds me, you shouldn't say that, it's sometimes more than a part of full-time job. But it's a passion and an honor to serve. So um, yeah, there are no requirements uh, that I'm aware of. It's just when you feel you can do better representation of the people at a, but there are costs to having additional uh, uh, county commissioners. There would be extra costs incurred by the taxpayer. Interesting. Um, yeah, I would not have known about any of that. I appreciate the question. So just a reminder to everybody now, we're gonna go into, uh, we're kind of gonna format the rest of this like a panel discussion. We have Kathy on the phone and then Stan will continue out. I'm gonna just alternate asking them questions. And like I said, as a reminder, we do have the Q&A open. So if anyone wants to ask a question, I'll ask relevant questions as we go. Otherwise we'll save the rest for the end. Um, so my first question to Kathy, cause we haven't heard from Kathy yet. We're gonna kind of just ask about your, perspective and everything, but to take a step back to get us started, um, I know Stan already touched on this a little bit, but can you briefly explain why we do redistricting? Yes, thank you, Andrea, and thanks for the opportunity to present tonight here. I was um, interested very much in, in Stan's um, analysis of the process from the Washington County perspective, as you know, I've seen it from the Anoka County perspective, and it, it is fairly similar. 
But um, my first experience has been with the legislature. And, you know, to take the step back and, you know, answer why, why do we do this? And it's based on equal representation. And you think about every 10 year period, how much the population changes in different ways. You know, even 50 years ago, think of how um, how many farms, how rural most of the United States was. And now it um, seems like every 10 years, there gets to be a larger urban areas in each state. And so um, those uh, boundaries for the uh, for Congress and the legislative positions and other elected officials, those need to change to keep up with that so that there isn't one area that's overrepresented and, you know, vice versa from the other part. But um, in particular with the state of Minnesota, um, when I served there for 12 years in the late 90s, early 2000s, I realized that many of the state laws were set up at the time when Minnesota had a population of about 2 million people. And at that time, it was 1 million in greater Minnesota and 1 million in the metro area. Well, now with the population of 5.5 million and counting, um, you know, the majority of the people, of course, are in the metro area. And as you look at the urban, suburban, exurban area, and still there's, I believe it's still only around 1 million people in greater Minnesota. I mean, certainly there's regional centers that um, have a lot of the population base, but um, uh, one of the laws that was put into place when there was a a million in each was our... um, funding formula for state highways. And so I always wondered why rural areas get such a better deal on their on their funding formula. And, and that's why, and it's a very difficult law to change, but um, there were a lot of uh, laws that were put into place at that time. So it gives you kind of a unique perspective how uh, more and more people have uh, moved to the urban core of Minneapolis-St. Paul area here in Minnesota. But based on that equal representation so that it doesn't matter where you live, in the state or the country, you should have a value of elected official that's equal to everybody else in the country, at least once every 10 years. And of course, we are living through unique times here with COVID and how that has affected the census with the delay in putting the numbers together. And I'm even interested in finding out information later about um, the movement of people after um, you know, the pandemic first started a year ago, I I know um, that in the state of California, they have lost massive amounts of population to their nearby states. But yet, you know, the census goes by the date of April 1st. So I'm sure their their numbers that they have for California were are going to be much higher than they are today. But it it is only it does only occur once every 10 years. So anyway, um, that's kind of the lead into that. And I know you wanted me to uh, talk about some other issues with this, right, Andrea? Yeah, my other follow-up question is that it seems like the word that people know and and know is a bad thing is gerrymandering. So I was wondering if you could just give kind of a brief explanation of that and how that ties in and why that's why that's bad. <laughs> sure. Yep. And it does kind of have a bad com- connotation with it, and it relates to a uh, governor, Jerry, and I forget which. Uh, Eastern state it was uh, many years ago. I'm sure Paul Huffman, who is very knowledgeable on this topic, could probably tell us that. But basically, gerrymandering is a redrawing of district lines, which would favor one group over another, so um, that a particular party would have a better chance of winning future elections. And, um, you know, I often look at how the Minnesota um, elections end up after every census. And I would tell you that these last 10 years have probably been some of the most fair maps because uh, you saw a changeover in the majority in both the House and Senate. And so that means that each political party probably had a fairly even chance of taking majority. I mean, of course, that's debatable, but, you know, tied in with uh, gerrymandering are the two words packing and cracking. And uh, with packing, that's um, when a large portion of an opposing group is put into few districts in order to win the others. And cracking means that it's an attempt to gain a small voting base in uh, as many districts as possible. So you're going to see some attempts at that, although, um, you know, Stan mentioned with the uh, court system doing it um, over the last few decades in Minnesota, you know, and actually, you know, how that goes through the legislature is 
you almost have to have a, a state like I think there's a 23 or 24 now where it's a trifecta of the House, the Senate and the governor are all the same political party because of the very political nature of redistricting uh, makes it so that if if a state does not have all three, uh, there's almost no chance of agreement. So, you know, the process in our state here is the House and Senate each introduce bills. And as Stan mentioned, they have the committees that have already started meeting there. And then uh, ideally, if they can come to an agreement at the end of the legislative session, or in this case, you know, it's going to be a special session in the fall once the, the census numbers comes out, if they decide to go ahead with that. And then the key thing is that the governor has to sign it. Well, you've seen many other bills over the last year or two that, you know, the House goes one way, the Senate goes the other way based on the majorities, and then it probably never gets to the governor's desk. And so um, most people are predicting there's a very high chance we will again go to a, a three-judge panel from the Minnesota Supreme Court who will decide those issues. So, um, yes, we're living in unique times here, and um, I'm I hope that you, you know, make note of of some of the things that are happening, you know, just once every 10 years. And hopefully with the pandemic, it will go another 100 years before we have to deal with that again. But, um, yeah, that's the information about gerrymandering. Um, and and Paul Huffman, who's a member of our league, did put on that you mentioned, put in our notes um, is Massachusetts in 1812, Governor Eldridge Jerry. Um, uh, and am I remembering correctly that then it was called gerrymandering because the district that was created looked like a salamander? I don't know yep, if I'm remembering that's that right. right. Okay. Yep, <laughs> All right. You're right. Yep. Um, I I'm going to ask one. We've, yeah. <laughs> um, and then there was one question that just came in that I think is relevant to what you were talking about. Uh, to what extent um, does party politics impact redistricting in Minnesota? Uh, you'd be surprised comes into play in a big way. And and most most people have no idea. And, you know, a lot of the activities are done behind closed doors. But, you know, I served on the redistricting committee in 2000, 2001. It was only my second term in the Minnesota House. And so, you know, I was kind of a newbie to all this stuff. And I was sort of surprised that the first day of the redistricting committee, um, what the staff did is they went around and they plotted the um, home location of every legislator on the big Minnesota map. And I said, well, why do you need to do that? I mean, it should be despite who lives where. And I know later on, there's going to be a slide that says uh, that it's supposed to not be a protection of incumbents. But uh, I will tell you that's very much so based on where people live. And I know that there are legislators that are willing to move um, based on you know, how the boundaries end up changing. So, um, yes, I will say it was, it's probably the most political activity in a 10 year period that any legislators get involved with. Um, my next question for you, I think you just kind of started um, to talk about that is um, wanted to ask you about your experience with redistricting at the mm -hmm. state level, since that's the process we have to go through first. And then from there, I think we're mostly going to move our discussion and talking about the, the local redistricting level. But um, if you want to talk right. about your experience at the state level first, that kind of gets us started to lead into the local sure. level. And it, it was quite an education process. And of course, if you look back over every 10 year period, it's really evolved recently. Um, I mean, back in like the 80s, they didn't even really have very good computers that would do mapping. So a lot of the mapping was done by hand by staff members. And, you know, redistricting is a process whereby, you know, you're putting together a puzzle of the state. And I know Paul refers to it like a, it's like a balloon. So if you push one place of the state and make this district a little different or a little bit different size or shape, well, that affects the next district over. So um, it's interesting with um, this year, um, Senator Mark Johnson from uh, Senate District 1 is the chair of that redistricting committee in the Senate. And um, most people are, you know, varies year to year, but, you know, you would look at a map of Minnesota and start up in the northwest corner of the state, you know, bordering North Dakota and Canada. And that, of course, is Senate District 1. 
So I, I don't know that they're required to start up there, but um, that seems to make sense. And then every year there's kind of a different way that the districts are numbered when it comes to the, um, the suburban areas. So I know just personally, I, I've, I haven't moved from um, Anoka County area for 40 years. And, you know, the numbers have, have varied, you know, in the 20s and the 30s, the 40s. Right now, I currently live in Senate District 35. But as far as serving on the committee, um, you know, typically, you know, if, if the census had been uh, ready on time, um, the the committee would be more involved now in looking at the mapping. Um, they've done a couple of basic things at this point, just history of what's going on with the process. And then um, the committee put to get well put together a list of criteria uh, very specific to this redistricting and then um, once maps are available they'll go ahead and start plotting and I'd like to tell people don't pay attention to the first set of maps that come out because they're they will not be the same maps that will end up and of course you know if it goes to the uh, three judge panel, they only release one set of maps. So on February 15th, 2022, that is the maps that will be for this, the, the, for, uh, the congressional seats and the legislative seats. But, um, you know, it was interesting during a typical um, time frame for the redistricting committee, uh, you know, they would try to get the first set of maps out maybe in April or May or March or April of a uh, redistricting year. But then um, by the time they'd have a, a final bill in May to send to the governor, um, those maps would be totally different. And um, so it's just the way that the members of the committee, the staff is all working within that puzzle process and how the GIS people put those maps together. So it, it's very interesting and because it only happens every 10 years there's not that many people who really understand the mechanics of it and behind the scenes but certainly with technology we've really evolved in that regard uh, we've had some really good questions that are about um, uh, redistricting at the state level but i want to make sure we stay on topic with talking moving to our discussion with local redistricting so i will save those if we have those at the end um, but just wanted to let people know because we have a bunch of questions about that so um, my next question for you kathy is if you could then tell us about your experience with redistricting at the county level right and that was very different of course i was not an elected official at that point i was the government relations um, director after i retired from the legislature and so uh, involved from a staff level of looking at um, what happens with the county and of course you know they have to wait for the maps to come down uh, from the three judge panel you know the court system is we're probably going to have this next time around too and then working um, you know, of course, within the county boundaries of the population growth, um, you know, what's changed. But much of the activity, at least, you know, 10 years ago was done behind closed doors. And, you know, when I was talking to Andrea earlier, I said, well, you know, because there's maybe one staff person who really has any experience with that, and it's once every 10 years, it's it's pretty limited as far as what's involved. And But there is kind of the political piece that, the elected officials look at for, you know, what happens with their district. So if there's, um, you know, a certain area of the county or the community being redistricted that has grown a lot, um, you know, obviously there's dealing within that 10% issue, which by the way, for the legislative seats, those are typically about 1% difference between those legislative um, numbers, you know, you take the, the whole state population and divide it by um, 67 Senate seats and then work from there. So, um, of course, where the legislature right now is based on a population of about 80,000 people per Senate seat and the population growth of the state, you know, they're probably looking at 85 to 90,000 would be in the new um, districts. But anyway, getting back to the county level, um, yeah, I was pretty surprised how there wasn't a lot of visibility with it. And, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that's probably fairly typical with most counties, just because so few people have done it or, um, you know, 
don't really, they don't, there's not as much time either. That's the other piece is that everything moves quickly, but, you know, I know we're going to get into some stuff at the end here with, so what can we do in this next go round? And I think, you know, public input is really important and for people to be talking to their county commissioners, their city officials, their, you know, I was on the school board during that time. So I was involved in the school board redistricting. So um, they definitely look at where people live and then with the population change in the area. And then also, um, you know, Stan mentioned about, so part of the um, elected official um, board would serve a two-year term and part would serve a four-year term. And that's also very political as far as um, depending on if you want to be on the ballot during a presidential year or not, you know, because usually um, there's a lot more voters in a presidential year. And so, um, you know, that's, that gets pretty political, but I think there'd be probably a few people who would admit that. And I'm a civilian now I'm retired. So I can th say things that maybe I couldn't say when I was elected official. So there you are. <laughs> Thank you. It's really interesting to have your perspective, having been through this in different uh, at different levels. So mm -hmm. um, I have a question I want to direct to Stan then. So we're going to switch back to Stan. Um, so kind of trying to recenter us here on uh, on the local redistricting and in Washington County too. Um, you know, just as we we're thinking about how to how to help people wrap their heads around this, so we're not just thinking about you know what are the the dates and the rules and all of that. So kind of the why does this matter, right? <laughs> why should I care about Washington County, for example, and where they draw their their lines? Um, and we think that kind of goes with the you know many people tend to assume that. Uh, a lot of our, our services are provided by the city when that's not in fact the case. It is in fact that the county provides quite a lot of our local services. So I was wondering if you could talk about what services the county provides. Yep. Uh, thank you, Andrea. First, I wanted to compliment Kathy and all her wealth of knowledge on what she provided and the dialogue was very interesting. Um, yeah, uh, it's really thank critical. Yeah, thank you. It's really critical, particularly that uh, proper count at the federal level. I'm going to talk about two parts. You asked about the financing, why that financing is really critical that comes to the county because the state creates laws and uh, rules on the services, but really the counties implement almost all the services on behalf of the state. And it really starts with that financial piece. So if we lose uh, a congressional seat, uh, our state won't get as much money. Uh, we have seven congressional seats. It may go down by about a seventh one with one less congressional, uh, congressional seat. That's a huge amount of money. So then that's divided amongst, that money we get from the federal is divided amongst 87 counties. And then, um, Depending on our population, state funding is largely, a lot of it is uh, done on a formula. So state funding is based on population. We have growing population in our county, but it needs to be properly counted. So we try to play a role in identifying people that be counted. There's a lot of hidden, even homeless people are transitioning between housing. So every person counts, uh, not only as a human, but to be counted for uh, properly be uh, funded by our government and our taxes. So, so when we get that money and if we don't get as much money, then we have to rely on property taxes. Um, and we don't wanna increase those if we don't have to, especially when they're mandated federal and state programs. So I'm just gonna highlight some of the type of things where a lot of residents think maybe the city provides this service or the state, but we, uh, we provide all the human services, most of the human, nearly all the human services and health services from child protection, licensing of child care providers, housing services, and then many of the public safety services, probation services, uh, services about being released from jail, 
Uh, we operate the county jail. We operate the county's attorney office and all the prosecutions locally. We operate the sheriff's office, which patrols all our townships. Out of 40 something cities, we only have about five that don't have their own police, off, uh, police departments. And then we uh, serve all the lake bodies of water, including the St. Croix for that public safety on those bodies of water. And then we do have all the significant county roads, uh, the regional park system, the regional library system, and we administer the elections, which I think are done uh, with high quality. Uh, there's not a county in our state that doesn't handle these with complete dedication and really good accuracy. Uh, you don't see people alleging things in Minnesota. Um, and then uh, we even value uh, properties on behalf of all the cities. And the value of the property is that determines the tax you pay. So it's very critical, the census, to getting our proper tax dollars distributed to our county. And then it's uh, because we provide a lot of services to the people. And this is just a question that, that I had, and I honestly don't know the answer to this. Does where the commissioner lines are drawn, does that affect funding at all? Or is funding even through all of right. the, the, um, the constituents? It, it does not affect funding. We, we fund strictly based on need and where the population are. So ours is the least political of the drawing the boundaries because we're basically reacting to after the cities determine the precinct boundaries and where those polling places are. We're just gonna divvy up the precincts to balance out the population amongst the five district county commissioners. We'll probably put anticipation of where we see the growth coming in the next 10 years so that maybe a couple of those districts would be uh, within 10%, but on the short side for they can absorb growth and you can maintain that equal representation under the law. It's part of the Constitution, as Kathy also pointed out several times. Okay, um, I am going to go back to Kathy to ask her about the criteria for redistricting then. Um, if we could share, I've got a slide that has, um, so this, this is the League of Women Voters U.S. position on redistricting. So these are the standards. These aren't, you know, what what the law is or what um, anything like that. This is just what the um, League of Women Voters. I mean, um, some of this is part of the law, but this is what we would be, you know, advocating for. So, um, Kathy, my question to you is um, just if you could talk to us about the criteria for redistricting. Sure. Yep. Good question. And, um, you know, what the League of Women Voters has is really an excellent list. And, you know, I had mentioned earlier with the redistricting committees in the legislature, they put together their own bill about what specific criteria um, they want in place for the legislative districts. And they don't really change that much from decade to decade. But I think, you know, this is a good list, you know, basically dealing with a substantially equal population. Yeah. Uh, the uh, if the districts are contiguous, and we actually have an area in Anoka County that's uh, split up with um, the Mississippi River as far as how one of the legislative districts is. So, you know, they do make exceptions to that from time to time. But, um, you know, all the things they're looking at now with, uh, you know, racial, linguistic minorities, um, you know, everything should be set up fair so that there's an equal uh, possibility for people from various communities to be able to win a legislative seat or congressional seat. Um, so, you know, certainly, um, you know, getting all those things in place ahead of time helps to determine then is, you know, are the maps fair? Are they the correct maps? And what I've watched as, you know, the legislature did their mapping and then it went to a three judge panel with the Supreme Court. Um, it was interesting to see how they did change some of the lines from what was submitted. And, you know, of course, they're always starting off of what the current information is, but um, they looked more at a lot of geographical boundaries. I was surprised how like railroad tracks came into play for splitting up some 
areas um, where the legislature, not so much when we were doing our mapping. But anyway, all those criteria that are set up in the, in the beginning are what um, those maps will be weighed against when it comes out to the final maps. I'm going to um, ask, uh, go back to Stan for another question. I realize the next question that I had planned to ask you is sort of, sort of like what I had asked you at the end of your last question. But um, my next question is, what is affected by where the county district lines are drawn? And I think you already answered. It's it's mostly just who the commissioners are. Um, but you know, for example, I had each each district is served by a commissioner. So if the lines are moved, then each commissioner that serves the area would would move a bit their area that's served. Um, so if the district lines didn't follow the criteria that Kathy was just talking about, um, a citizen's representative could come from a, a very different area, for example, um, and possibly not understand someone's needs. Do you think you could speak a bit about that? Yeah. Um, the federal law and statute, we follow that and the example would be is one we wouldn't pick out precincts intentionally to eliminate like to put two current commissioners in one district um you wouldn't do that by intention uh i guess in theory it could happen as a, a logical shift based on census so when we shift the boundaries we will factor in um I think one of our statutes or principles, uh, a lot of what we establish as principles is to have that, I think you were talking, how do you, certain population groups, ethnic, racial, you know, I think we would, uh, because it, it varies throughout the county, I think we would try to pick a boundary. A lot of it will come down to natural precinct boundaries but maybe would, we would assign a precinct or two would shift to the appropriate commissioner district if you could get good solid representation rather than split those groups up. Uh, so there is a principle to have uh, kind of a consistent, uh, probably won't word this the best, but kind of consistent and fair uh, uh, representation uh, in the best kind of light for those groups, different kind of groups. You know, could be even age would be the same um, there. Um, if that answers your question, it, it, it's a yeah. difficult one because we have to pick existing precincts. We can't divide precincts. Mm -hmm. So that kind of leads me to two questions. I do have a question about precincts, but the first thing I want to mention um, is you know, just for context too, we're aware that in, in 2011, that Washington County had approved um, to redistrict by a set of criteria. Um, and that is something that as a, as a league, we had talked about as an advocacy thing that we could do would be to advocate for local governments um, saying that they would abide by certain criteria. So that's not necessarily a question to you. I just put that out there to the audience that um, if, you know, if other people who are um, attending this program might be in other counties, that that might be something to take into consideration, or if other local governmental units are engaged in redistricting, that that might be something for them to consider as well. Um, so, and the criteria were, are similar to, you know, what the, what the league had, um, has as recommended criteria. So, yeah. um, Andrea, if I and, could yeah. interject, I would yeah, encourage you whether it's individually or as your League of Women voter to submit those suggestions, probably in 2022, early 22, late 21, we'll have a website and other mechanisms to submit that. We'll certainly consider those because mm -hmm. we really try to take that input of the, every kind of citizen mm -hmm. to do a better job. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I think I got a little out of order in my question. So let me just see where we are. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask about precincts and I'm going to ask this to Kathy and then I may go back to Stan for another one in here. But um, 
Kathy, I know we've been talking about precincts because they affect where the county lines are drawn. And I'm just going to take a step back too here and say for people who are um, attending, the reason that we're not talking about our local city governments is that the primary cities that Woodbury, Cottage Grove area, League of Women Voters covers um, only have um, we don't have wards, we don't have districts. So Woodbury's, uh, just as an example, Woodbury only has at large um, city council members. So our city council members aren't tied to specific geographic locations in the city. Uh, Cottage Grove is the same and so are our other local areas that we, um, you know, that we serve. So that is why if you're wondering, well, why haven't we talked about Woodbury or Cottage Grove? That's why, um, because they don't engage in redistricting because they don't have representatives that are tied to certain locations. However, what the cities are responsible for doing is drawing the precinct boundary lines. Um, so, you know, a question that arose is, you know, the precinct boundaries, you know, what we know of them is they're, you know, affect where we vote. Um, and then the other thing that we've seen it tie in is um, that the, the county commissioner lines have to follow the precinct lines. So I don't know, Kathy, is there anything else you want to talk about as far as, you know, why, why are precinct lines important? Or is there anything else we should know about it? Or is it just simply this is where we vote. <laughs> or, um, <that's laughs> well, there is more to it than that. And actually in Anoka County, we do have wards and precincts in most of our communities. So I'm pretty familiar with them. And I'll give you a little example. Um, so in the city of Ramsey next to Anoka, um, they have, um, oh, I forget how many precincts it is now. I believe it's either 12 or 13. But, um, you know, of course they, receive the legislative maps and then they have to you know decide the boundaries based on that well there was one house district that was mostly the city of andover which is to the east of ramsey but there was you know they needed a little bit more population to get to the size of a what a house seat was supposed to be so they needed to you know go west into the city of ramsey so there's one precinct it's a, a ward one precinct two which is um it got really unusual boundaries because of how the uh, house district was set up. And then the rest of ward one is precinct one, which is in a different house seat. But, um, you know, of course, each of those two precincts have uh, different voting locations, but uh, ward one precinct one has triple the number of voters than ward one precinct two. And it was just based on how the lines came over from the house district to you know kind of present those boundaries so it's it's not the greatest setup as far as trying to you know keep the population even within those but they had to deal with what they were given so it's just odd um i'm gonna go back to an earlier question i had which was does uh, how does redistricting at the state level impact the county's redistricting process i think that is kind of our our part of our answer then too is um you know because that filters down to the precinct level and then the county has to redistrict based on the precincts um is there anything else um that you'd want to share either of you would want to share about that andrea one point i forgot to mention it's important is we try not to break up cities amongst county commissioners. Mm. Woodbury is so significantly big, it has three commissioners. Primarily Commissioner White has one city, about 70% of Woodbury. I have about 20%. And then um, uh, Commissioner Johnson has about 10% in rough numbers. And it couldn't be avoided uh, 10 years ago. There's always a concern with five commissioners that you'd have three out of five representing Woodbury. It hasn't been violated with bad government uh, influenced. So it's worked out well, but we, we would try to normally avoid that. So we don't like to split a city. So we haven't had to split up too many cities. I share Mata Midai, uh, which is about 13,000 people, I believe, with Commissioner Fran Miran, who's I represent the north part. So by I represent eight cities total. Um, most of the commissioners are right around eight cities each. Um, Woodbury's unique. 
So it, it just makes it easier to represent cities by not splitting up. So that's one of the, the principles. And uh, one thing about the precincts, I know that when I was mayor and on a city council, the precinct uh, voting uh, locations, they've shifted from what used to be schools that was very disruptive to a day of school, which has become more and more sensitive and valuable where kids aren't displaced for that day because of voting happening. And they're using more churches and things and they're volunteering. And I think it's really important that cities do a good job. And I think they really try hard to get a nice noticeable voting uh, precinct voting location that's not hard to figure out. And, and that's reliable that voters can count on that that's where they voted two years earlier because that's really makes voting uh, free and easy for people uh, to get to. We wanna encourage voting. You wouldn't wanna make the precinct voting a very non-conspicuous, poorly lit, uh, hard to find place. Um, that reminds me, um, if we could pull up my slides again, the one where we have Kathy's photo, but go to the last two slides. I just thought it was interesting to look at the, um, let's see if Mary can get these up for me. There we go. I just thought this was interesting to look at. I just pulled these up today and you can kind of see, um, so this is, this is on the left side is the county commissioner district and on the right side is the precinct line. So you can kind of see where they pull in. Um, so this is for Woodbury. Um, and then the next slide is for um, is for Cottage Grove, if you wanted to move to that one. And I don't really have a, necessarily a comment here. I just thought it was kind of interesting to see the shapes that they do really line up pretty well with the cities, um, yes. more or less. And the parts that get pulled out are probably more, you know, following those criteria that they're, um, you know, more related. Um, yep. So anyway, that was, I just thought that was interesting to look at, so. Um, well, you know, if I could add the, just something real quick, yeah, yeah. Andrea. Um, Go ahead. Uh, city, of, city of Coon Rapids, it's either the first or second largest city in Anoka County. They always have a debate between Coon Rapids and Blaine. But uh, Coon Rapids, uh, uh, after one of the redistricting plans, um, none of their state legislators lived in Coon Rapids. But Coon Rapids was split up in such a way that it had seven different house districts that were touching it. And so I had the discussion with the city council members whether it was good or bad to have more legislative districts in your city. And they figured out pretty quickly that the more legislators you have speaking on behalf of your community, the better, the easier it is to get funding. And so um, they ended up being pretty accepting of that once they realized um, that that was to their advantage. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, and kind of related, another interesting point is the Congress, uh, United States Congress, they don't have to live in the district they represent. Uh, Jason Lewis did, uh, Angie Craig now has that district, forgive me, I can't remember what district it is offhand, it includes Cottage Grove and part of Southern Woodbury, but he did not live yeah. in that district. Uh, but that's a really interesting fact that you're congressional woman or congress congressman does not have to live in the district they represent um, of course I that's am, not the case okay. for the legislature legislature you do have to live in the district yeah i am going to ask just a couple of questions that came in that were kind of related to what we were just talking about um and then i will ask kind of my last question to kathy and then i'll go back through all of the other q a things that have come in so um i wanted to just ask Stan, um, are the counties, county commissioners uh, responsible for school district funding? Um, no, uh, we aren't. Um, if you were to look at a tax bill, it's basically broken up with state property taxes and, uh, or I should say county, city, and school district, those three entities for taxation. So they have their own taxation. What we do do as a county, though, we try to collaborate with counties uh, with any of the social service things that can help the schools. An example right now with the vaccinations growing, the county starting to play a larger role with the 
COVID-19 vaccination. I was just spending a lot of time the last few days making sure uh, we were having some issues with the school district 622 I represent, which straddles both Ramsey and uh, uh, Washington County. And we both have to play a role. And also it's so important to vaccinate uh, teacher and school people and students that are at higher risk. And that's always a factor. So we try to coordinate and, and really work with the school districts where we can, but we don't control them and, and they don't use any of our taxation, our county taxation money. And then the other question that we had was, um, you had referred to a website to um, submit um, information and you had, um, the question was, which website were you referring to? I think perhaps you're referring to something that was would be coming, but. Yeah, uh, I don't think we'll make a special website of be within the county, but we'll probably have a tab or something. And as far as I know, it's not set up now, but I think sooner the better. I'll talk to our staff about uh, setting that up and when to have it set up. And if there's going to be a, a delay uh, by law or some other reason, I'll, I'll try to let you know when to anticipate that. Uh, website, but uh, if there's nothing holding it back, why not start to take input now? Is what I say. <laughs> All right, so that's a perfect segue to our last question, um, which I'd like to ask to Kathy. Um, what should um, citizens or you know league members? I think a lot of people who are attending this are league members, although it is open to the public, so we have, may have other people um, <clears throat> listening along. Um, what should we be thinking about for engagement in the process of local redistricting? You know, where's where's our opportunity for input? Well, you know, I think we've been talking about it all along as far as, um, you know, people in the community just approaching their elected officials and, and talking in terms of this is a really important process. And, you know, keep in mind, you know, where the growth areas have been in our community and um, <clears throat> the diversity, that the change in uh, so many different things, especially in a lot of the uh, suburban areas. And so that, you know, the new boundaries need to reflect that. And, um, you know, it, it's appropriate for everyone to be heard in the process. And so I think when there's truly equal opportunity for people to run for office because of how district lines are set up, that's really important. I mean, it's really the basis of our whole country. And um, I'd like to remind people that if you're ever thinking about running for office, the best year to run is a year that ends in a two, such as 2022 coming up. So those new maps are gonna come out probably in February. And um, that will be probably after the precinct caucuses and then shortly before endorsing conventions by the political parties and shortly before filing for office in late May, early June. So if somebody is thinking about running, you might want to start raising some funds this year, um, putting together a list of friends and family that you could talk to for fundraising or volunteering. And then when everything's moving very fast next February, uh, you're ready to jump in and so many other people will not. And then also I'd like to point out that um, at the legislature, a typical two year turnaround, there's generally about 24 new legislators every two years um, due to retirements or people who were defeated. Well, in the year that ends in two, that number doubles or triples. So oftentimes you'll see legislators who will decide to retire because of redistricting that their district has changed so much or possibly they're paired with another incumbent. So, you know, it's just natural that there would be fewer incumbents. So particularly for women, I think this is going to be a great opportunity um, in next year's election and just really encourage people to have your voice heard now with those elected officials to let them know that that representation is important. And then if you're thinking about running, get, get your campaign in order. You can even start now. <laughs> Great, thank you. 
Um, a follow-up question to that is, um, you know, in what way is public input important? Um, in other words, uh, what should we say and to whom? <laughs> well, for sure to legislators who are in the middle of this process now, even if they're not on the redistricting committee, they will probably take a vote, at least on criteria, even though, you know, the census mapping stuff won't come through. You know, they'll probably have a special session in the fall, perhaps to do it, um, but you know, it would go to a three judge panel. And of course the the Supreme Court panel would, would be looking at whatever the legislature sends to them as kind of a basis. That won't be the, the end point, it will be a starting point. But so talking to legislators about, you know, different things unique to your community, different things that have changed in the last 10 years, just having them be aware that um, people are watching. You know, I mean, like I said, when I went to the county, I was almost kind of surprised how private it was sort of behind closed doors um and i i don't think it should be i think there should be more people involved in it. and i like you know stan's idea about you know getting that website together soon and people submitting ideas so um it's a great way to be involved and my last question that i have for you on engagement is what is the most effective action for leagues to take in other words where do you think the league of women voters specifically is the most effective in this area well, you know, the league is really known for their candidate forums. And so, um, you know, for some of the city offices that will be happening this year, of course, it won't happen again for the legislative offices until the next election. So obviously, you know, at, once the new maps come out, that'll be a, a big role for next year's elections. But, um, you know, looking at the criteria, like I said, the, the one from the U.S. League of Voters is actually a very good list. And so, um, you know, having the league impress upon local elected officials what that is, you know, I mean, I could see this being put together as a letter to the editor, a letter to all elected officials, or, you know, doing a Zoom meeting on it. I mean, there's so many different ways to engage. And so, um, because chances are the elected official hasn't gone through it before either. So they're open to hearing what people would like to see for their own community. And, of course, the more they hear from their constituents, I think the better decisions they can make. Thank you. Um, well, I'm just gonna look at our Q&A now and see what other questions, cause that kind of wraps up what we had for um, our agenda. Um, it seems like most of the other questions that we had are more about the state level redistricting. So if you don't mind, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so one of the questions is, and we'll just, you know, whoever wants to answer, I suspect Kathy may have more of an answer on this one, but, um, given the population shifts, are there any predictions yet about Senate districts that are currently too big and others that are already known to be too small, or do we have to wait for the September census results that make any guesses on what areas of the state need to be combined and where new seats could emerge? Yeah, that's a difficult question, yeah, because you can't really act on anything until those official census numbers come out. I think, you know, a lot of areas are just aware of it just, you know, based on current population changes. You know, the school district is really in tune where people are moving to and from in their communities, so they have a good handle on that. Um, and then it's just a matter of, you know, putting some ideas together. Um, you know, obviously with that balloon, that kind of push pull and how things will um, be adjusted according to the neighboring areas, you know, um, mainly the advice I give is a lot of communities should be talking to each other and among each other for um, how the political uh, lines will be drawn in as far as the local Republican and the local Senate or the local Democrat um, organizations and, and how they will deal with uh, endorsing conventions next year. So if you are have a neighbor now who is in a different house district or Senate district, you very well could be in the same one, you know, come February. And so working together, making, you know, more connections now is always good for being able to handle that once it happens. 
Um, one of our local members I mentioned before, Paul Huffman, has a map that he actually, I think, is queued up to share. Um, Mary, I wonder if we can make that happen. We could also ask another question while we get set up, because I know that's a bit of a, a tech switch over, because he is not one of our panelists. But um, let me just grab another question. Um, this, I think, is also for our state level, that if, um, if Minnesota loses a congressional seat, would all um, would everyone have to rerun for seats? What happens in that case? Oh yeah, well every two years they have to rerun. Um, oh yeah, let me think about U.S. Senate. Well, the U.S. Senate races, of course, are statewide, so that I think is unaffected. But the congressional races, that those are every two years anyway. But like in the Minnesota House and Senate. Um, the House is unaffected. They run every two years. But for the Senate, that's the one most impacted. Right now, the senators are in the middle of a two-year term, and then the next two terms will be four years. So in other words, every 10-year decade, they have a two-year, a four-year, and a four-year. So that when the new maps comes out, all senators have to run in new districts. Their term is up. Okay. Um, I think... Paul is ready. He was going to share a map about uh, that shows the population of yeah, Minnesota. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Yeah, two things that I just one of these things I just got today from the state demographer. This is a map of Minnesota uh, in shift of population from 2010 to 2018, and what that shows you is those counties that are in brown. Those all lost population between 2010 and 2018, um, and so that you know, shows you that, that there is a reduction. And then the areas in blue to varying shades, those all gained population. You can see the biggest gains are Hennepin County and Ramsey County. So that, that shows some of that. But the other thing I'll show you, so you know that those areas that are brown are gonna have to get bigger. I think that was the question is, do we know where those lines are gonna change? And to Kathy's point, almost all the lines are going to change because of those changes in population. And if you grow one place, you're gonna to have to push the balloon around. The other thing I'll show you is the, uh, the uh, district map. The, um, you know, and if, if you can see that, the, um, the areas in Brown and Washington County that shows you that we've had a very large gain. If it's that dark brown color, that's over 4% increase. So in the areas of 53A, 53B, and then 39B, uh, which is up by Stillwater, uh, those have had some of the biggest increases in population. The light blue down there in 54B, um, which is down by Cottage Grove and down toward Hastings, that's had actually a decrease in population. So you can see that that those those can, those uh, house districts will get smaller. That'll affect the Senate districts, and so those lines are going to draw, going to change, and so that gives you a sense of how those maps are going to change for the state as a whole. Thank you, Paul. I think the maps are so interesting to look at. I just um, it really helps to, to kind of see where things are changing. Um, you know, the only other question that we had is who selects judges that form the committee in case, you know, the legislature is not able to come to an agreement. Um, I don't know, uh, Kathy, would you be able to answer that? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. It's a three judge okay. panel. I'm guessing Paul yeah. has some idea on that. Paul, do you have an answer on that? Absolutely. Yeah, the state Supreme Court identifies the panel. And that's, um, there was a special redistricting panel in both 2001 and 2011. Um, there is a possibility, one of the things we're talking about in our alliance is asking the court if we can get um, the standing with the court is asking them to consider a commission as opposed to a judicial panel. And a commission would give us a lot um, more uh, kind of uh, uh, ability to look at policy. So, but the Supreme Court is the one who decides who, how that's set up and uh, who's on it. All right, I think that is all of our questions. So um, unless any one of our panelists, you know, has any sort of follow-up information, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, 
just appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks. Is the, I learned a lot tonight too. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it oh. too. Thank you. I hope I could be helpful. Yeah, it was really great to hear both of your perspectives, Stan and Kathy. We really appreciate it. Um, in that case, I'm going to turn it over to our president, um, Betsy Stites, to just uh, close us out for the night. Thank you again, um, Kathy and Stan. It's really excellent. And I think, as we said, this is kind of the beginning of lots more information over this year that we're and next actually as we heard um, that it's going to be important for us as citizens to be aware of and to keep educating ourselves about so thank you thank you very much um, in closing i just want to um, highlight some of the upcoming programs that we have because i think you'll really enjoy them one is on march 15th uh, it's another Zoom meeting, and uh, Don, Don Arnesta T is going to be talking about regulatory capture and Minnesota government um, working for is it working for public interest or special interests? And I think it's going to be a wonderful program. Uh, we're hosting it with White Bear Lake, and which would, will be great. Then on April 19th, Gretchen Zabel will be um, speaking about water and our current legislation. So uh, looking forward to seeing many of you, if not all of you or more at our upcoming uh, programs. And again, thank you very much to, for being part of this evening and have a great rest of the day and the week. <laughs>